Thank you, Angie. Angie made a number of great points, and, and I'm certainly not going to repeat those. I mean, a lot. some of our emphasis was on physical accommodation issues, but also some of the educational accommodations that children need uh, in this school age and the junior high school years. And I'm going to try to briefly go over some other things. And it's kind of difficult. I promised I'd be brief, but I'm the one who has a mother who spoke for 15 minutes to a wrong number when I was a child. So, so it, you know, it's a, it's a little challenging for me at times. Um, so um, Angie mentioned that, and I, I don't want to reiterate this point because I think it's really important, is that you need to be advocates for your child. You are the one who knows your child best. You're going to have to advocate if you don't. No one else is likely to do that. Uh, well, except those of us in clinic. We're really good at advocating also. <laughs> But often in the schools now, they're, they're, they're really challenged with so many different children and so many needs and being underfunded that you're not going to get what your child needs without advocating. Uh, within the school age years, one of the issues that I think is a really important one to, ab to advocate in terms of appropriate programming for children in the IEP are issues related to their uh, learning problems. And a lot of children with spina bifida, and I've talked with a bunch of you in clinic about this, have characteristics of a nonverbal learning disorder, and I'm not going to go into that a lot. Um, but because of that, really do need a lot of special programming and accommodations, and even for the children who are pretty high functioning intellectually, um, we'll still see that there are areas that they struggle in terms of weaknesses, as all of us have our weaknesses, um, and they need some special programming to ensure that they become as independent and function as optimally as possible. Um, and it's important, as Angie said, to, to really work with the schools and advocate. And that does not mean to be an adversary. You want to have an ab you want to be an advocate, not an adversary. And you want to try to work together with the schools, but also to really repeat to the schools and emphasize what your child needs and what your child's rights are when you need to do that. Um, and that needs to start in the preschool years, as we've mentioned some, as Mailani mentioned some, and um, Jackie, that we need to start that early, not even just in the school age and the um, junior high school years. And one of the things we really want to push for a lot, there are a number of goals in terms of looking at transition, but we do want to prepare children to be as independent as they possibly can. Uh, we want them to have a good quality of life as adults and as children. Um, we want them to have a well-rounded life, which means not only are they possibly employed or they have some alternative activity, but that they have recreational activities, that they have a good social life, that they have leisure time activities that are important for them. And to get to that point, they're going to really need to be developing skills all the way through their school years and, and developing in all of those areas. Some of the barriers to transition, there are, there are a number of them, but just a few that I want to emphasize um, is one is sometimes unrealistic or inappropriate expectations. I tend to um, uh, subscribe to the Goldilocks school of expectations, you know, the philosophy, you don't want them too high, you don't want them too low, you want them just right. Um, if they're, they're too low, your child's likely to sink to the level of those expectations and do a lot less than your child's capable of. If they're too high, your child's going to get frustrated and just give up and feel like people want something of me that I absolutely can't do. So, so really trying to be appropriate with them and push them to an, at an appropriate level, but not, not to a point that is really not realistic for your child. And that will involve developing skills that they don't have. So if your child isn't very good at uh, math, then you need to work with the child on developing those math skills the best they can. If they have fine motor skill problems, you want to work with programming to improve those fine motor skill problems. Um, and that's going to happen, a lot of that is going to happen through the school because when it comes to the school years, that's where your child spends most of his or her time. You know, they spend a huge number of hours within the school setting. And if they're not getting what they need in that setting, they're not going to go as far as they can in their lives. Um, I have a handout up here that mentions just briefly a little bit about nonverbal learning. Also on the Primary Children's website on the Let's Talk About handouts and a bunch of you I've given the handouts to in clinic but they're also available on our website, on the Primary Children's site. Uh, all the Let's Talk About handouts, not just mine, but everything that's produced by the hospital is there. And then some resources in terms of getting more information about transition and programs and some specific kinds of goals to maybe think about for your school-age child as to what kinds of activities you want to involve them in, what kind of skills you might want them to develop.